for having me. Um, it's always a pleasure and an honor to speak to your constituents, so the people that you intend to help. Um, yeah, so I'm not a doctor, a clinician, because uh, I can't think of uh, what you all go through daily. And so we're here to help. All right. That said, I'll stop the weepy stuff. Um, just a review. IBD is a complex situation involving host microbiome and also environmental interactions. And we heard a lot about this today uh, throughout, you know, it's a common theme throughout the day. But really where I'm going to try to focus um, is give you a little bit of information on the microbiome and a little bit about the environment and then a little bit about how those two interact. Okay, so um, this is going to be a blitz and we're going to try to learn something as a team. But uh, I'm sure you're all well aware of uh, all the media outlets getting on the microbiome and how important it is in human health and disease. And I'm not going to do it justice in 25, 30 minutes. So first of all, just a question, how big is your GI tract? And this audience is probably very knowledgeable. I put this slide up a lot of times in, uh, in classes and such, and there's a very heterogeneous pool of answers. But um, just to show of hands, letter A, uh, letter B. Wait, do you mean like if you took it out of you and put it out, or do you mean surface area? I mean surface area. If you surface spread your GI tract out okay. as far as it could go. Letter B. D. 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 Who, who else says D? Anybody say C? Okay, I guess it depends on what you think the average house is, right? But <laughs> the, the correct the answer is actually D. Or the if you don't play tennis, it's the infield of a baseball field. Um, so getting back to Al's slide of the anatomy of your small intestine, those little microvilli, also called brush border, um, increase the surface area of your GI tract exponentially. Okay, so we're talking about a huge area of your GI tract. So here it is, uh, blown up a little um, in cellular form. So you have these uh, invaginations into the GI tract. This would be representative of the small intestine. And if you drill in on the surface of these uh, villus structures, um, right along the end, uh, there's what we call the brush border that's composed of these microvilli. So you have villi and then microvilli. And this is why we have so much surface area in our GI tract and why it's important because we need to take in our nutrients, right? Everything that goes into our mouth has some nutritional value, hopefully, that we can glean off of it. So by the numbers, these are uh, the microorganisms associated as we descend through the GI tract. And this is a pictorial view showing heterogeneity, so different colors, right? So I'll get into what microbial diversity um, kind of means. But just as far as sheer numbers, you can see that the acidic stomach is less favorable than the distal colon. And just to put this into perspective, these CFUs, these are called colony forming units, and they can be thought of as cells. Okay, this is how many cells there are. But to put this number 10 to the 12th into, I guess, something that we can think about, 10 to the 14th is the number usually assigned to the number of stars in the universe. Okay? So 10 to the 12th isn't that far off. So that just tells you how many cells are in our um, GI tract. So other than algecitis, this is one of my um, heroes of science. And uh, early in his career, he began learning culture-based techniques, and he was interested in the GI tract. He was actually a German pediatrician who took samples from infants to try to understand what the microorganisms did to influence nutrition and to give infants their health. He would be an NIH-funded researcher today. The types of things that he was studying, the questions he was asking, we still ask today, and we still don't have a very good answer for it. What's his name? His name is Theodore Escherich. And Escherich might sound familiar to some people, maybe not to others, but Escherichia coli, or E. coli, is the most studied organism on our planet. 
It's a bacteria that Theodore Escherich cultured from infant stools, and we've used E. coli as a model organism to try to understand what microbes do. This was work done back in the late 1800s, and the same techniques we use today in the laboratory. But in the last quarter century, we've added technology to help us understand who's there. And what this chart here shows by year are the number of microbes that we know to exist based on two different technologies. One is just culture, what Theodore Escherich and all the other microbiologists did since the late 1800s. And then in these light gray bars, these are called clones, or environmental clones. So what are clones? These are organisms that we know to exist, but we can't culture them. And the only way we know that they exist is because we can look at their DNA and say, oh, that's a new chunk of DNA that we've never seen before, and that's an organism. So we used to be doing microbiology pretty much all culture-based. And this isn't all that long ago, right? 96, I was in college. So nowadays, the vast majority of the things we study, and this is a little dated, right? it's almost 10 years old now, but the vast majority of things we study now are simply by their DNA. Okay, so the granularity of detail that Al just presented on our cells that make us up, we are way far away from any of that granularity in the GI tract or in the microbial world. Okay, so it's frustrating, right? Because we want to know what are the good bacteria? What are these ones that give us some kind of health benefit? And we, that's where we're going, but we are just so far from that point yet, okay? And this is pretty much the main reason why. The only reason we can look and detect these things is just by looking at the DNA. Okay, so there are other issues um, with using DNA and not having that thing in culture. Microbes, um, I would say there's two big issues, two big problems with microbes. They're everywhere, okay? So they don't just live in one spot. They're everywhere, so it's hard to know why they're everywhere and how, how can they be everywhere. And they're simply not us. And what does that mean? Humans have five senses, right? We all look and interact with our world based on at least some of those five senses. We can group things that we see, that we experience, in the like organisms, okay? The story of Adam, you know, he gave names to things. We can tell the difference just by looking at a lion, that it's not a zebra, and it's not a hyena, and it's not a bird, right? When we look at microbes, we can't really get that same information just by looking at our microscope. Oftentimes, they look identical to the eye. But the other thing is, they don't evolve like us either. How much of our genetic material do we share with chimpanzees? 99%. There's been, yeah, estimates, but it's in the 90s, right? 90%. This is the tree of life as we understand it. And I just want to draw your attention to this animals. This is us. We're in the animals. What's the next closest related on this tree? How similar do you think you are to a plant, right? This is the, all of the bacteria that we know to exist. If you see how different they are from each other, they're much more different than we are to plants. That's how different the microbial world is. These are organisms that we can't very well culture. We find a lot of these in, in Yellowstone, in hot springs, but really we, we don't even know what they do. Um, we're starting to understand based on some great work done here at Montana State, but this is just to point out that the diversity of life as we know it is minuscule compared to the diversity of life in the microbial world. Now, we do the same things with microbes that we do with larger organisms. We try to name species, okay? And this is E. coli. Back when sequencing came online, we were able to sequence the whole genome of organisms and look at it. These were the first three E. coli strains that were sequenced. K12 is a lab rat strain, CFTO73 is a urinary tract pathogen, and 0157H that was what you get when Taco John doesn't cook their hamburgers or whatever. So 
these are pathogens compared to a lab rat strain. And this just is to, all I want you to do is to remember the number three, because that's how many organisms we're comparing, all the same species. And then the other number that I want you to remember is 39%. So three strains of the same species shared 39% of their genes. Not 39% similarity. The content of their genomes only shared 39% of their genes. When we do these similarities between humans and chimps, we say it's in the high 90s, we share almost all of our genes with chimps. It's just that we're about 10% different in the genetic code between chimps. These don't even share 60% of the genes. Okay, so if we want to know, if I say this is an E. coli strain, that doesn't really tell you a whole lot about the function that that organism does, okay? So, we talked a little bit about probiotics earlier. If I say, eat lactobacillus, when we buy yogurt with XYZ in it, what does that mean? You know, what strain is it? What does it do? What's its function? Okay, so this is where basically, hopefully this gives you a little bit of understanding about the diversity that we're talking about and the difficulties that we have. This is also important to understand. This was a study done in 1980 where they sampled E. coli again from the GI tract of one person three times. They sampled throughout a year and they just said how different are the E. coli in this person. And this is a sampling over just three different days, uh, March 5th, 6th, 7th. Every number here is a different genotype of E. coli. Okay, so on day, the first day of sampling, um, they took three different probes from this individual's stool sample and then cultured out the E. coli and typed all of this isolates from that stool sample. And on that day, they were all the same genotype. Didn't matter which sample they took. And then you can see the next day, wow, there's a lot more gen genetic diversity there and pretty evenly distributed among three genotypes. And then by this third day, now we have two completely different genotypes that are dominating in the GI tract. Three different days, three different genetic composition of one species. Okay? And even in that species, those three, the three most dominant types, probably only share something like 40-50% of their genes. Okay? A little hard to grasp that amount of diversity um, in the microbial world. So when we look back at the numbers, right, these numbers can condense, condense down into something on the order of 500 to 1,000 different species, things that we can tell are different. But because of that genetic diversity between microbes and the heterogeneity across time, this is an extremely dynamic environment. Okay? So the other things to take away, every chair in this room occupied with a human body contains 10 more microbial cells than cells that make up or that we encode in our DNA. Okay, so you're all more microbial on a cellular basis than you are your own body. Okay, and that's kind of cool to think about as a microbiologist. It's kind of weird if you're not used to thinking in that way. Things are crawling over you, in you, all the time. We just have no idea, we have no concept because we can't do the five senses, right? Okay. Um, I think there was a talk earlier this morning that mentioned this, but our immunity, right, our immune system is in tune with this diversity. 70% of our immune system is associated with the GI tract. It's called gut associated lymphoid tissue or GALT. Okay, so it gives you some idea of why we've evolved with our microbiome um, in the ways that we've done that. And then lastly, just to reiterate, everybody in here is different. Your microbiome is different. There's no reason to think that you could eat the same thing and everybody would have the same outcome. In fact, there's a little saying to help nail this home. You're more likely to find five people in this world with the same fingerprint than the same microbiome, than one person with the same microbiome, okay? 
So you think about that's how the cops say whether you did a crime, right? So that's a pretty good indicator of individuality. But you're more likely to find five other people with the same exact fingerprint than one person with the same exact muscle body. Okay? And that's just playing with numbers and those are kind of gimmicks, but it gives you some, hopefully some appreciation of how different we all are. Okay, so we're going to switch over to talking a little bit about the environment. Um, so this comes right from the CCFA website. Uh, for reasons yet not yet known, IBD is largely a disease of, developed, of the developed world, uh, principally in the U.S. and Europe. And um, it's more com common in urban versus rural areas, and these northern climates versus tropical climates. And then the last piece of the puzzle, disease increases when populations move between these areas. Okay, so the best natural experiments are just simply saying, you came from the tropics, you went to New York City, what's your incidence of IBD? And that tends to happen, and also in the reverse. Okay, so that's curious. What, what explains that result? And you can see these epidemiologic studies where the darker green colors represent the higher incidence, and then as you go into more of Eastern Europe, or yeah, Eastern Europe, the incidence tails off. But um, some of the expl explanatory uh, stories or hypotheses, what, how do we explain these results, could be due to sanitation. You know, these places are very sanitary as we develop. So sanitation just in the U.S. You know, has had profound influence on morbidity and mortality. A lot more people used to die and they're just at the turn of the 19th, uh, 20th century compared to the turn of the 21st. We've done well to clean things up and help people live longer. Here's the flu pandemic, if you're interested in that little spike. Um, and so this is comparing um, uh, developing countries, so India. You can see it started way up here kind of recently, but due to you know, heightened awareness and efforts to sanitize, these are the deaths per uh, 100,000 population. So this does an amazing job at decreasing mortality and morbidity. But that's not the whole story. The IBD hygiene hypothesis states that some of these interactions with pathogens or other microorganisms that we've cleaned up and eradicated actually were beneficial and that we killed them off um, sort of collateral damage. So the hygiene hypothesis simply states Raising children in too clean of an environment, too hygienic, promotes intestinal dysfunction in very And that's simply a hypothesis. Okay? We need data to back that up. Joel Weinstock and some others are credited with this. But really what they wanted to know is what's missing. Okay? If this is true, can we identify the bugs that are, are no longer there? And when you look at epidemiologic studies, you can simply ask what's there and what's not. What this is showing in, in green is um, well, I'll get to what STHs are, but a little hint there. Well, anyway, let me just go through this. <laughs> yeah, so uh, the red countries are where these uh, STHs are found in their public health problem, and the lighter pink is where they're found, but they're no longer a problem. Okay, so meaning that uh, you can find them there, but it, they no longer really infect people. And when we look, um, the countries where we see high incidence of IBD, um, are either no longer there or they're no longer a health problem. And STHs simply mean soil transmitted helminths. Soil transmission um, for helminths is, is kind of part of their life cycle. The eggs develop into infected larvae, uh, stages of their life where they can infect people, typically in the soil. And in, and in humans, there's a couple um, of, of large ones, round worms, whip worms, hook worms, these are not things that we want in our system. Okay? These particular ones, these will make you sick and they're not good to have. Okay? So don't run out and get yourselves. Um, but the things to point out, and these are dated numbers as well, but how many people are infected in the world with helmets? And even now, with all of our sanitation, over a billion people, billion and a half, are infected with these helmets. But look how many are either sick or actually die. Even with these ones that cause disease, there's a number of us that don't even know that they're there. OK, 
okay, that are infected, but they're just hanging out. And they rarely, if you look at the numbers, these are millions, these are deaths per thousand. These numbers are way small compared to this. Okay, so these organisms at least fit that hypothesis. So Joe Weinstock's lab really did a lot to develop this into experimental models and test it. And they completed two different clinical trials. They were small, yes, but one's with, one was with ulcerative colitis, one was with Crohn's. Both showed that they were effective. Both show that these helmets could protect from disease, but also they didn't cause any damage in uh, normal people. And the helmets that they were using were not the ones that infect humans. They were not these. They used a helmet from a whipworm from a pig. Okay, so it can't set up a dominant infection in people, and therefore it's a little bit better. But really, we don't know how it works. Okay, and that's what Joel is getting at here in this review paper was just simply to say these are five possible mechanisms. And the one that my lab studies is what if this helmet comes in and because of its life and the things that it secretes, it changes the bacteria, the microorganisms, those things that are all diverse in all of us. What if it has an influence on those and that total change then feeds back into the host? And that's really what my lab tries to study. And for that, we use a particular very long game helmet called Hilomazoides polygyrus vigori, or we just call it poly, because you have to be a grad student before you can even pronounce it. <laughs> and then we look at different stages of its life cycle in mice, because this is an actual, this is a helmet that specifically infects mice. We look at how it sets up shop and what it does to the microbiome and how that change in those microorganisms feed back to the host. So, here's another learning point for everybody. If you're going to look at the microbiome and make sense of it, either by looking up papers from things that we do, you have to be able to read one of these plots, okay? So, everybody just pay attention for one minute. We're going to learn something, okay? So, these plots represent space, okay? And I'm not going to get too philosophical here, but the closer two points are in space, the more similar they are. And similarity means microbiome. So all of those species, all of those organisms, we can look at one gene and say, yeah, same or different. But not just that. By looking at all of the sequence data, we can say how similar they are. Okay? So the closer to space, in space, the more similar that whole microbiome is to each other. Does that make sense? Okay, now I'm going to hit you with some data. So, experiment one. We took mice, we infected them, or we didn't infect them. Okay, I'm showing you two parts of the GI tract, either the cecum. Humans used to have a cecum, it's now part of our appendix, but you can think of this as sort of our, as the, the mouse's uh, main, it's where the microbes are most abundant in the mouse. So that's why we look at it. And then the distal GI tract, the ileum the small intestine. Okay, so we infected the mice, we either looked at the cecum or the ileum, and then we simply asked what did they look like from infected and infected in each of those areas. And here's what the data look like. In the cecum, you don't have to take my word for it, you can see that the, the uninfected mice, the open squares are different in space than these black squares, but statistically speaking, they were no different. We could not differentiate them. Um, we couldn't differentiate them apart. But if you look at what happened in the ileum, the uninfected mice were very different than the infected mice. And this is for one of the reasons is we think is that's where the worm, when it comes into the mouse, that's where it sets up shop. That's where it interacts with the host immune system and where it could potentially interact with the microbiome. So that made sense. And then we did it again, and our mice started off at a different place, um, but same result. The cecum looked very, very similar, couldn't statistically differentiate them. These look a little closer, but we still couldn't differentiate, or we could differentiate these organisms just based on the ileum and whether they had this H. poly or not. So, our results were that the change in the gut microbiota was associated with this infection. And that's about all that we could say. We didn't know if it was causative or not, but we could say that there was a difference there just because they were infected. Now, when you want to put names on bugs, you do these things and you give them a name based on how similar their sequence is. 
in the database. And again, there's a lot of microbial diversity in things called lactobacillus. But it was encouraging that if we're going to look for organisms that might be beneficial to the host, we find something that, at least in the literature, is suggested to be beneficial. Okay? Lactobacillus increased statistically in abundance in the ilium of infected mice in both experiments. So even though these two mice, these two mouse experiments started off very differently, they all kind of ended up at the same point in terms of lactobacillus in infected mice. And so we published this um, in inflammatory bowel disease. And since, two other studies independently reproduced the result. H. polygyrus infection saw a significant increase. You can see these pie charts. Here's the naive mouse, the uninfected mouse. So the infected mouse went, lactobacilli went from about 26, about a quarter of the whole microbiome to dominate it. It's well over 60% of the microbiome after 14 days. And here's another study by another group. Um, they looked at lactobacillus and uh, grouped it with another very closely remembered uh, related um, family of, of microbes called uh, lactococcus, but they showed that their H. polygyrus infected mice were at a higher abundance than the other mice. Yeah? This is going to be a weird question, but I'm going to ask anyway. No problem. Mice, no matter what you infect them with, empty their bowels in the same way. Humans in civilized countries sit on a toilet, and in uncivilized countries they squat, which closes off the ileocecal valve, which can transfer different types of bacteria back and forth, and also straightens out the sigmoid colon so they can empty more easily and not strain, thereby causing those bacteria to go in different places. So, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> just, I follow you. Just when you're going from mice and then trying to apply it to people, yes. you know, if you go back to Burkitt in the 70s, is it the fiber or is it the way people empty their bowels? And everybody went, oh, you got to have a high fiber diet. Oh, Nobody see, yeah. looked at yeah. how people empty their bowels, whether they use a toilet or whether they squat. Right, so I'll throw this at you. Um, mice are even more different than that. They're totally big. I don't know what that means. That means they eat their own food. Oh, great. Yeah, so they're great at recycling the microbiome. Um, so H. poly is not going to be used for human therapy because it can't set up shop even a little bit in a human. That's why we use a, the pig whipworm for humans. But our goal is to use this as a model. And if we can understand the interaction, then we can try to translate that into human studies. We can't really do macaque studies or ones with um, uh, primates very easily. They're very expensive studies. You don't want to do volunteer studies yet on humans. There are clinical trials that I'll mention at the end. But these are just models. And they're just to generate ideas that we can then look at humans to see whether it's the same story. But that's a great, yeah, that's a great idea. Um, just plant the seed. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> We'll try to make them poop on a toilet. <laughs> so just to point out, these other studies did what we did not do. And they're, they're starting to look at cytokines, like what Al was talking about, and how they change in the presence of antigen from the organism. And I'm not really, for the sake of time, going to be able to go through some of this, but um, certain cell types that they're finding that are associated with this change um, are very important for dampening the these particular cells, um, without getting into too much detail, are called T regulatory cells. And they really are, their function is to decrease inflammation or decrease, decrease the inflammatory response of certain immune cell subsets. Okay, so how do we study this? I'm just going to give you a brief introduction to my lab. We have mice in bubbles. And that means these, what that means is these mice are sterile. They don't have any microbiome. So you have to start out with something that you can add microbes too. You can't give antibiotics and completely clean out the colon or the GI tract. They don't work that way. They give, they give you, a, uh, they decrease microbes, but they never make an environment sterile. So you have to start out with mice and bubbles. And here's our bubble. These are mice that we ordered. They come in a shipper. The shipper is completely sterile. You can see little mice in cages. And then we hook them up to bigger cages that we can actually manipulate. 
Um, we put them in there and they grow up happy. We have media in here to test and make sure that the environment stays sterile. It's interesting when when you die, when all animals die, they bloat, right? These don't bloat. There's no uh, gases produced by bacteria inside. They just shrivel up and they don't smell. <laughs> they poop and you take the poop out and it don't stink. They're really cool. Okay, so the other things, I just call them guts in a dish. This is mainly a slide from a class, so you have to come up with catchy titles for students to remember things. But we've worked with developmental biologists to understand how cells go from stem cells to mature tissue. This is mature intestinal epithelium in a dish. These are human cells. These aren't mice. So we can actually study how human responses, responses of human tissue, respond to the microbiome. We can slice these things open. We see um, invaginations that kind of look like villi, but we, we can also see very mature looking microvilli, the brush border that the epithelial cells have. And we're starting to use these as a more uh, translatable model to, to human infection. And then just, this is E. coli, so we can put in bugs and watch how they set up shop, watch what the epithelium does. So the good news is that a lot of these ideas are being translated into human studies um, through uh, these new clinical interventions that mainly look at the helmet and the microbiome. These are the numbers. These are 14 ongoing clinical trials in the U.S. Not all are focused on IBD, but the, the most, um, most of the clinical trials here in the U.S. are focused on IBD treatment. These are all with Trachyrus suits, so the pig with one that I mentioned before. So this is the, the cool one, and I just threw this up because they're not yet completed on enrollment. So if you're interested in these clinical trials, all you have to do is um, go to uh, I think it's clinicaltrials.gov, and you can get involved with a clinical trial. Um, so with that, I. Just thank you, um, Montana State and also funding agencies. But I'd be happy to take.